next up i'm i'm handing over this the position of the host to my colleague anamika who will introduce the fantastic speaker that we have up next yeah thank you very much rohit um i hope you all have enjoyed the talk so far and uh, okay how many of you have seen the schedule i'm pretty sure you all know who's next yes so uh, right now uh, i'll introduce the next guest to you uh, santhiri uh, have you all heard about minecraft so santhiri has been has been the uh, you know the co-founding uh, co team of minecraft um, he has been uh, he's a gaming expert he's a gaming enthusiast and he's also he also wants to be a right and uh, he supports a lot of entrepreneurs to in pursuing their passion and he's per presently working with satakunta university of applied sciences and he is a phd researcher at the university of temple uh, it has been an amazing you know listening to santeri i had an uh, the joy of interacting with him earlier uh, you will enjoy the stories the lessons of his life the experiences that he shares and we look to hearing from you sir so no pressure uh good morning everyone uh if there's a bit of background noise uh there it's very early morning here in finland uh we have a one and a half year old hugo in the next room and uh he just woke up so sorry if there's any uh, any disruption in the background uh so yes my name is santeri goviso thank you very much for having me uh it's uh, it's an honor uh good morning to everyone so uh, like Anamika said, uh, I'm currently working as a senior advisor in, in a university here in Finland. So my background, I've been 10 years, uh, I've been a tech entrepreneur for 10 years, uh, doing my own startups, uh, pretty much. Uh, a small, small correction there. So I was actually the founder uh, for the education side of Minecraft. So we worked very closely with, with the core Minecraft team that was located in, fin uh, in Sweden. And I was running and manning the uh, the team in Finland, who was building, which was building the the education version. Um, so my plan is to go back to startups. Uh, I've I've now done ten years of uh, first. My first career was in startups, building my own companies. Now with a small kid, uh, it's really nice to enjoy this more steady lifestyle for a moment with the university. Uh, work on the on the research and work on the work I'm doing with other companies. So really, my um, my focus currently in the uni in the University of, of Applied Sciences in, in Satakunta here in Finland is to help uh, tech startups, well, any types of startups, uh, any type of entrepreneurs to start their businesses. So basically, I'm I'm there when one of our students uh, comes in and says that, okay, I've been thinking of this idea X. And then I'm the guy who says, "Well, that sounds pretty exciting. So let's dig in. Let's let's dive in, and uh, and help them to, you know, uh, design the the business uh, business model to build a pitch deck to think what type of technologies they might want to use. Uh, our university is also investing in companies, so we are pretty well equipped to to help our students to to build companies." Not all of these companies are about AI uh, because we are a very fo focused on tech. We have AI Academy, we have a robotics academy and in the university. Um, there are almost all of the companies leverage AI or machine learning in one way or another. So, uh, so AI comes up a lot. I'm not an AI engineer. I'm actually an educator myself. So uh, my PhD works on uh, uh, focuses on on games in education. I've done my my studies in in applied education, so I'm a classroom teacher. I haven't done a single day of uh, honest classroom teaching since I've been fully qualified, but that's that's another story. Uh, but in any case, uh, the years in the university have really taught me a lot about what are the 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 boundaries for new businesses currently, what AI can provide easily, and and what what's what's more challenging. So really, that's that's the core and the really really the cake of my my talk today. So I was thinking of splitting this uh, 30 minutes into three pieces. Uh, first one is uh, is my own personal story. And why I, why I want to share that is that because I was just like you, I was uh, uh, I was very fresh 
a university student uh, first year when I realized that maybe entrepreneurship could, could be for me. So I'm going to share that story because it's, uh, it's very simple, uh, just taking the opportunity. So I hope that's inspirational to you. Then the next thing is that I will go through uh, the best picks from our AI experts. What are those technologies that as a newcomer to AI that you could potentially look into? Like what, what could you start building today? Uh, or if you have a business idea, what type of AI based technologies or machine learning based technologies are there that might be quote unquote, the lowest hanging fruits that you could implement to your business or build your business around. And then the third one, which I think is most exciting one is, is to share a few stories from my students or our university students and how they have been using these technologies and what they have been building. So really people like you, uh, being first year, second year university, just taking the initiative, what they have been able to achieve with a bit of expert help. Uh, so hopefully that that type of packages is, is something that that sounds interesting to you. And so let's let's kick off. So really about my own own backstory, uh, I, 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 I sucked at school. I hated school. Um, a few things that I really liked, video games and also playing the piano. So I, I mostly focused on that. Surprise, surprise, I ended up in a university because I ended up doing relatively well in high school because there were subjects that were interesting to me. And university in general was very interesting to me. But already during the second year of, of university, or I would say even the first year, I, I realized that maybe entrepreneurship uh, would be actually my way to go. I want to be my own master. And I started this tutoring company. And the point was to facilitate teacher students to teach local kids uh, and give them extra classes, things like that. You know, this happens everywhere in the world. But in the particular city, the particular area, and in Finland, there weren't really the demographics to actually buy this stuff, buy this service. And to be very frank with you, really honest, not a single tutoring hour was ever sold. So it was a miserable failure. Well, but really why I think that this was one of my best success successes so far was that it only took me about four to six months to realize that this will not work. So I feel like I was very knowledgeable about understanding and with understanding that, you know, this will this idea will not work, let it go. Because many times entrepreneurs get super stuck with their idea. Uh, they are fell in love, they fall in love with the, with the idea and it's hard to let go. So really, I one thing that I'm always teaching to my students is that, you know, we can do so much to see if this idea has potential. And based on that data, we can do the decision if this is worthwhile continuing or not. And really, I think that if you can, fail fast, meaning that you can check if this has potential or not in a quick manner, it can save you, save you a lot of time. And, and really, of course, it, it might save you a lot of money as well, but money tends to be something that comes and goes. One day you have more, one day you have less, but time is a resource that you will not get more. Well, maybe you come up with an idea of a medical company that actually uh, is able to stretch time or stretch human human lifespan. Maybe maybe that's the case. But today, that's that, that is uh, you know time is the most valuable resource. At least I feel that way. But uh, but my second company was different, uh, and I want to share this in more detail with you. So I I tried Minecraft. Minecraft just came out from Sweden. Um, I, I tried it uh, just to play myself. I, I played it for a month. Uh, super excited. Really good game. Uh, and I and I was a substitute teacher in a local school. I took the game uh, and played it with my students. It was a massive hit. The students, uh, the teachers, and some other school staff from other schools contacted me, and they were like, "Hey, you did something really cool there. Can we learn more?" And this was the sort of the first sign for me that, you know, if people approach me, there must be something exciting here. And uh, then I approach Moyang. So I literally sent an email to the CEO of Moyang, the Minecraft developer, asking that, hey, I have this tutoring company that was in the, in the drawer. Could my company be the representative uh, for Minecraft in Finland? Because we have done all this work with students already. Well, he replied to me and said, I said, let's have a Skype call. And the Skype call literally went like this. They said, I have, you know, we have no idea what this would mean. 
I said, well, me neither, but, but should we try? And they said, okay, let's try and send us some sort of a contract that would actually make this happen. So me asked me, you know, second year education student to write a contract for them. So I had, of course, no idea how to write contracts. Now, during that same time, uh, there was a teacher in in uh, in United States who started sharing about his uh, his experiences with Minecraft. Um, I got in touch with him. We once more had a uh, once more with an email. Uh, we had a Skype call. We really synced, and we decided that hey, we should actually be doing this together. The third thing I did was I sent an email to a, a applied science university next to my, my classical, my home university, asking that if there would be a Minecraft developer or a coder who would be interested in such, such a project. And one guy replied, and that guy became uh, the CTO of, of the company, one of the co-founders. So now what happened was that we had three founders, one CEO, one education United States expert, at least soon to be one CTO, who was able to create the actual product. We were, I was negotiating soon to be one of the most valuable gaming assets in the history of, of mankind uh, to have a right to distribute that. And since we were now working in the United States and in Europe, uh, we just decided that, hey, why don't we just uh, have the rights for the whole world and for the education part and, and let's, let's, let's see what happens. Well, what happened was that it was the opportunity that, that came to me. I took the initiative and after 20,000 schools that we, uh, that we actually had our, as our customers, uh, Microsoft first, became, uh, first came to purchase Mojang and then after that they purchased us or acquired us. And it was four years after, after we started. And really why I wanted to share this, I was you know second year university student send an email, was able to get the contract with the, with the game developer, send another email, was able to you know, get the key co-founders uh, to come alongside with me. And you know, every, everybody can do this. And, and it's just you know, me realizing that now this is the moment for me to act. And I think that these type of moments come to everyone. Uh, it's some get more, some get less, but really I, I think that one, of, one big part of the entrepreneurial mind is that you realize when your moment comes and, and, and then you take the initiative. So very simple. And, and uh, of course, there was a lot of work building the company, all of that. A lot of things goes into that. But really, the, 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 where the spark happened, it's something that is, I, I think, all the entrepreneurial minded smart individuals uh, could you know, take that initiative. So I hope this very simple, simple stories is something that you you feel like, uh, you know, uh, that that can get your sensors working for you, like where to find these uh, these opportunities. But let's that's that's enough about me. Uh, let's uh, let's move more further into the AI field because of course that's something that you you came in in here to 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 listen to. Uh, I hope this first part was was just a bit of inspiration for you. So now. All of this, of course, led to a point where I had the experience that now I have the opportunity to work with one of the cool universities in Finland that is focusing on AI, and they headhunted me basically from my sabbatical to, to, to work with them. And, um, and I went through all of our AI experts in the, in the school and asked them, okay, what should I tell to you? Like, what, what are the quote unquote reasonably a reasonable effort, meaning that with going to YouTube, going online, uh, talking with experts, what could you start building? What could you start um, learning? What could you start you know, building uh, from, from today? What, are, what might be these uh, topics and fields of AI? And what they came, um, came up with, or at least the consensus was, and this might be needless to say, but really there are two things uh, that you need to consider. First one is, is understanding AI and understanding the concept uh, and context where AI is going to take place or where does it going to help. Then the second part is the engineering part, technical, the technical work. And sometimes there are masterminds that have both of these, uh, but, but in most cases it's it's the people that understand the working context, 
they understand the limitations of, and, and possibilities of AI. And then there are the people that are, know the algorithms or the engineers. And now the communication and the social skills matter when these people work together. Now, as a minimum thing that I encourage everybody to do is to get the basics, like not necessarily coding basics, but you know, read a couple of books, r listen to a few podcasts about AI, go to YouTube, just to understand like what the current possibilities and limitations for AI are. Because you learn very quickly that it's hyper powerful, but it's powerful in a very specific context where enough data comes up and, and you know, the AI can really focus on solving a specific tasks rather than you know general uh, general big uh, vague tasks so now the understanding part although being needless to say maybe is something that is very key and very crucial not only the engineering part helps if you don't understand like what the context what the purpose what the what the goal is so if you are not going to be an ai developer there can still you can still achieve a lot by just understanding you know the capabilities the, the working conditions and all of that so let's start with that so study try to understand where ai currently is what is possible what is not but when we move to the more technical things i have three for you now the first uh the first technical aspect you know the first application uh what what we came up with uh and all of these by the way are something that our uni university students are using basically from day one so these are part of the curriculum of our ai academy as well so the first one is machine vision and what it means is basically a you know this video camera looking at me or the ai is looking at pictures and, and doing analysis based on those pictures uh, so of course it's basically the same thing but uh, it's more real time when it's actually the video camera for example putting sunglasses on my face but now how to start with this there are already many ready taught neural nets available online which many of them are state of the art currently and maybe one of the easier ways to get going with all this is that you look into a ready made machine vision uh or a neural net meaning like uh, there is one open source uh neural net that recognizes dots on your face basically like key points of how human face is structured for example nose eyes different parts of eyes things like that you take that neural net and you basically train it to understand different data or you use that neural net to put on sunglasses or funny hats like you know some of these apps like instagram or snapchat are doing uh, so this could be one one that you can very simply get going and and one thing that you can do when you get get further with this now that you have tinkered with with one of these neural nets is that you start collecting your own data so you keep the neural net that you you found online uh, and then you start, for example, taking pictures and you are teaching the neural net uh, to recognize something from those pictures. So this is once more a really good exercise. For example, if the person is playing guitar or the piano on the picture, you just need to collect the data. And now, of course, this goes back to one exercise, really good exercise is that when you are collecting the data, you start realizing like what are the capabilities for the neural net so what can they what type of pictures they can actually uh, filter what type of pictures what type of characteristics on the pictures can help the neural net to actually do the decision is it a guitar or a piano and, and what matters so you can not only understand and start understanding how the neural net is working but also how to prepare and what type of data you need for the neural net to actually actually work and then of course it comes down to you know finally teaching that neural net unfortunately we can't go to really deep with with all of this but it's just like one idea to to start studying with start experimenting with is the machine vision with ready-made neural nets and that you can first you know just tinker with then you know uh transfer do transfer learning them uh, to basically use different data sets uh for existing neural nets and then finally you know building your own data sets to teach the neural net other things so this was the first one, so the machine vision part. So the next big topic, uh, what, they, what, they, what our experts say that it's one of the low hanging fruits is uh, a more simple, well, not more simple, but uh, also more straightforward data analysis. 
So what this data analysis is that is really there are massive pools of data already available there online. For example, you know, a if let's say you are a game developer, you are getting you know gameplay data, you are getting achievement data, monetization data, advertisement data that you know provides all kinds of you know this flood of data to you. So now how can you start making good decisions out of that data um, that basically you can use to make your game better or make your game monetize better or be the game to make it more enjoyable. Um, so this is one one aspect. And uh, currently there are, you know, we are living in a world where it's it's the, the data and having data is not a problem. It's just how to chew it. So once more, there are multiple, you know, data analysis, uh, you know, neural nets that are available there that could, uh, and algorithms that could be used to do data analysis. But once more, you know, the really, uh, maybe this one is more focused on the understanding and less about the technical skills, but you know, need to understand like, for example, the working context, like what do you want to achieve with the data analysis? Plus, you know, what type of real life interactions, for example, in, in, in a game, uh, for example, you know, what type of behavior the player is doing in the game, what correlates well in real life with better game performance? So you need to understand the, you know, the real life uh, sort of functions before you can go into data analysis and teach the AI to look into the right data so they can so the AI can provide you meaningful meaningful feedback. So the data analysis is definitely more on the on the understanding the capabilities and what you want to achieve than the technical side. So hopefully that's also one uh, one one good example and you know uh, something that have been done a lot is that for example there is a engine that gets a lot of sensory data and based on the sensory data uh, we are predicting let's say engine failures potential engine failures the engine condition things like that so there's so much you can do with with this one as well and you know the business pot potential and opportunities out there are are, are massive for for data analysis as well so now the last one, and this might be a, a really, really cool one, I, I hope. Uh, so the last uh, last sort of theme, AI theme or machine learning theme that, that we wanted to pick uh, to bring up is, is called generative adversarial networks. So this is one of the cool ones. I definitely, you know, encourage you once more to go to go online and, and learn much more about this. Um, but um, now typical neural network, uh, tends to learn is focused on learning characteristics of you know different categories to learn differentiate categories L let's say that you know you are using neural net to uh, for example uh, categorize is this a Picasso's or Van Gogh's art so two classical artists they have certain characteristics in their in their pictures and the art that they are doing and now you are using the neural net to basically uh, help, you know, teach the neural net to real uh, recognize if it, this is Picasso's art or Van Gogh's art. Um, so typically, you know, machine vision can be machine vision can be used in in some of these cases. Now, so the GAN network come into play, so the GAN, so the adversarial network come into play when multiple neural networks work side by side. So now these adversarial networks can be used to create like a really amazingly realistic looking Picasso paintings uh, or human faces or, or composed music. Uh, so for example, where this type of uh, adversarial two neural networks or, or multiple could work is that, for example, you build a video game where there are random NPCs, non-playable characters that come to, come to the player, come to your main character. They might have AI generated faces, uh, they might have, you know, voices AI uh, generated. They might have background images that are just, uh, you know, neural net created, or even, you know, background music. And it's sometimes really hard for humans to realize, like, which one of these are human created or which one is AI created. Uh, so these are just basically two neural nets or multiple working side by side uh, to, you know, create these pieces of art. And once more, these neural nets are available. Many of these are available online and uh, for free, so it's something that it's easy for you to just uh, download something and, and start tinkering with. So 
if you are a content creator uh, and you want to be a content creator, maybe these you know, adversarial networks are something that you really want to uh, dig into. But OK, so these were really, really quickly put uh, three, uh, three picks from our curriculum that, that we, I wanted to bring to you and what our AI specialists wanted to bring to you. And these are something that you know, our first year university students are doing. So at least we consider these one of the most accessible. I know that I'm explaining them really fast. I'm, I'm explaining them pretty vague. But I hope that you know the machine vision, data analysis, and these generative adversarial networks are just words that now I encourage you and themes I encourage you to go and actually explore more. But now I think I have about five minutes left, so I, I want to go and tell you more about what our students are doing with this. So you, actually, you get more more flesh around the bones. Uh, what is possible with this? So now. Um, one one thing I'm sure that you have many of you have heard about telehealth uh, that you can go to a remote hospital, remote doctor appointment, uh, maybe with a video, maybe with a picture, so on. So this is something that one of our companies here, uh, my, my my sort of my uh, my students are doing, and and really what the cool point here is that when you open your open your phone and you know you you start queuing up to the to the doctor it will start asking you you know of course it recognizes you uh, it is it is studying your face it, it is asking you uh, certain parameters like how you are feeling things like that and it is comparing that to a massive data pool of patient health data uh, that we have been getting access with a collaboration with a local hospital so basically, when the the customer, the the patient goes to the doctor appointment after the queuing, uh, the doctor already gets a massive amount of information, AI digest information, from you know what the AI and the neural net is is finding from the patient's face, and also what type of you know alarm signals from the health history and other other places so looking at the newly di uh, diagnosed uh, uh, symptoms you looking at the face looking at the health uh, health uh, data combining these and looking to help the doctor to build you know have the best diagnosis possible so we are trying to also from the business point of view really achieve a super quick and efficient telehealth service as possible so this is one so now uh, staying in the in the health tech space another really really cool uh project from our students is uh, i don't know how well i'm ex able to explain this but uh you have these electrostimuluses that you know can activate your hand like or your muscle for example you have these small small dots here and uh and they combine that that muscle activation with vr and with eeg brain imagery so basically there is a stroke patient that for example stroke has taken out of their arm control they cannot use their arm so now the vr is providing mirror therapy uh, the dots are activating the muscles and eeg is monitoring what their brain is doing while they see the mirror therapy and they get the muscle activation and with that data, the AI is looking in the background and seeing what type of stimulus or mirror therapy, basically stimulus to the eyes and stimulus to the muscles, provide best treatment. So how, what type of uh, stimulus the patient reacts best and rehabilitates, rehabilitates them the most efficient way. So really, this type of technology can you know, explode uh, what we can do and how well we can rehabilitate uh, our stroke patients. So, so really cool stuff as well. So now, uh, maybe one more. Um, I don't know if you have heard that, you know, now that there are a lot of electric cars, there are also ships and other very expensive things setting on fire because car battery, uh, you know, started, <laughs> catched fire on, on a boat middle of the ocean. So one of the teams is working on a 
uh, machine vision application that is uh, following the space of, of, of a car space, maybe in, inside a ship or maybe somewhere else. And, and looking at you know the infrared signals, looking at uh, audio, looking at uh, just a normal video stream, and catching uh, signs of a battery is warming up to a hazardous point. So so the the crew of the ship or maybe a janitor or or somebody can react, uh, you know, well in time before you know a battery catches fire, which is really hard to then put out. So very simple application, much simpler than the other two, but really once more that can save lives and what can save a lot of money, especially if a ship is you know stays intact. But okay, so I've been talking a lot uh, about thirty minutes. I hope you know the last point I want to make, like all of these, what I what I told uh, that all of these are stories that people similar to you have been doing, ha are studying today, you know, have been able to build. So these students, for example, out of these, I, I think that these projects, if I hear these projects, I, I'm like, oh my God, mind, mind blown, like this is so cool. But then I realized that these are our students, you know, students that are maybe 19, 20 year old, and they are doing crazy things like this. And, and just, you know, the bright people similar to you, you know, curious people who want to learn with a bit of expert help. Uh, there are so much that the, these young minds can uh, achieve. So I really encourage you to do the same. I really encourage you that when you go to the university, the university time is the best time to start your business. It's the best time to find co-founders. It's the best time to use university equipment and, and all that and have the expert help. So I really encourage you to be active during your studies. Uh, you don't need to have a degree in order to, uh, you know, use AI because so much of that information is online currently. You can, you, you can, if you are curious and capable of learning, you can go online and learn most of this stuff. But if you are somebody who likes the social interaction, you know, uh, you know that you know that you want the structure for your education, you know, then university can help. And I think that university, you should expect this type of services that they can help you to also nest your business idea and your business building into your studies you should today you should already expect that from the university so I, I really encourage you to be active be entrepreneurial during your university and you know and also dig into ai if you are not a tech expert find somebody who is more engineering minded but for everybody i think that you should definitely at least build understanding uh, of how what ai can do for you and that you can do podcast, YouTube, live streams like this, hopefully, uh, and and you know sources that are not dictated by by any any you know university. But um, I don't know if there are some questions or uh, or there are, questions. Answer. there are questions, and it's always amazing listening to you, Santri. Um, there's a question that we have. It is how difficult is it to program an AI to recognize your eye and open a device or something like that? Um, uh, you mean like um, like like a security point of view or just? Uh, yeah, I think it, it means that security point of view. I think. Well, for, for this question, I, I'm sure that you know one of our AI guys uh, would provide a better answer. But uh, in order to just to give you a reference point, in order to create a Python script that uses uh, pre-existing neural nets to recognize your face and uh, you know start implementing, let's say, a funny hat on your face as an augmented reality app, that's that's five lines. So it, <laughs> it's it, it's it's it can be really really easy, really powerful when you know what you're doing. Right, and there's another question now. So how to integrate neural network into a desi game designed by us? Well, once more, I'm sure that you know a game developer would give you a much better answer for this. But now, uh, already there are pre-existing AI components, uh, neural net components in in uh, in game engines like Unity. So if you are if you want to explore that space, I would, and you are novice 
uh, or, or you don't have previous experience, you should definitely, you know, look into those ready-made game uh, development, you know, game engines and, and use their tools to begin with. Because typically how those are layered is that it gives you the basic tools that you can get started with. And then, you know, when if you know how to write algorithms, you know, there is so much you can do more, but you can get the basics very quickly. So Unity is at least something that that uh, I have experience with, and my teams have experience with, and they have been, uh, you know, ex extremely satisfied with that. Great, great. Um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for, um, you know, interacting with our students and boys and girls. Um, we have shared the connect. You can connect with uh, Sanctuary over the Twitter. We have shared the connect with you, and uh, looking forward to hearing more from you. Thank you very, very much. Have a Thank great you. day. Yeah. yeah.